Well, good morning, dear and precious ones. What a joy it is to welcome you, those of you who are worshiping with us online, those of you who have walked through these doors hundreds of times, and those visiting for the first time. Each one of you are so very welcome here. It is our intention that if you wanted a palm, you have one. If you don't have one and would like one, just raise your non-palmed hand and an usher will bring one to you. And if you are joining us virtually, I invite you to find something to wave as we sing our first hymn or simply wave your God-given palm if you like. Today marks the beginning of the holiest week in the Christian calendar. It is my prayer that you won't skip from Palm Sunday directly to Easter as if you're playing Monopoly where you do not pass go, do not collect $200. Please make it a point to join us for Love Feast this Thursday at 7 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall where we will reenact together the Last Supper. We will wash one another's feet or hands and share in a simple meal and partake of communion together. And we will continue to focus on true hearts of discipleship by offering our thankful hearts. If you are available on Wednesday evening at 6.30, the deacons would appreciate your assistance in setting up the tables. This is not physically lifting those tables, it's setting the tables, putting the dishes and um, that sort of thing. So if you are available at 6.30 on Wednesday, the deacons would love to see you here. Of course, next Sunday is Easter, and we will share in the parking lot. Um, you may want to bring a chair. I'm not sure how many picnic tables and so forth. So to be safe, bring a chair. And then we will gather here in the sanctuary at 1015 to celebrate the risen Christ. Like last year, the choir is inviting anyone who wishes to join them at the end of the service uh, in singing the Hallelujah Chorus. So if you have your own music, you're welcome to bring it. If not, music will be provided for you. Isn't this wonderful? All of these opportunities to gather and to worship are something that I do not take for granted. I am beyond grateful for these precious moments of connection with you all. And so having said that, what other opportunities are available for connection and fellowship? I'm Norman Mullinger. Looking ahead, in just three weeks from today, we will assemble 300 hygiene kits after worship on April the 14th. So please plan to stay on April the 14th to help. The supplies have been purchased, and the good news is that the cost of the supplies is about the same as it was last year, just under $3.50 per kit. You may place money in the kit supplies um, for the kit supplies in an envelope and drop it in the offering plate any Sunday, but be sure to make it for kit, mark it for kits. Now, if you've been doing any spring house cleaning around the house or redecorating your home, perhaps you have some wall hangings or paintings that you no longer want, would you please bring them in and give them to Jerry Bushlong because we could use them on the walls of the next apartment that we refurbish uh, for Brethren Housing in Harrisburg. And today, please help us by signing up to deliver a card or several to some of our shut-ins for Easter. Sign the paper in the narthex and then don't forget to take the cards along that you intend to deliver to today. And also there is a sample there so you can see um, what that card is like. I don't see any others, so will you pray with me? Jesus, you have walked this road with us many times. Guide our steps and keep us close. 
Inspire our worship with your loving presence and work in our hearts so that your spirit may flow through our lives as we walk alongside others. Amen. rise in body or in spirit and join in the responsive call to worship found in your bulletin or on the screen. You will read the bolded text, then remain in this posture of praise for the hymn and invocation. The way has been prepared. For the crowds, it is the way of celebration. For Jesus, it is the way of completion. Amid shouts and waving palm branches, he comes into the holy city. Open your hearts this day to receive the Savior. We open wide our hearts and spirits to receive Jesus the Christ. Please join us in singing our first hymn, number 238, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. Thank you. 
pray with me? Blessed one, our hearts sing with the children when we see you ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Our lips shout your praises as you empty yourself to become a servant of all. Open our hearts to the depth of your love that we might walk faithfully, obediently with you during the long week ahead. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, updated edition. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee.
For the last time this season, we will conclude our time of corporate prayer by singing together, Change My Heart, O God, and you will find those words on the screen. It has blessed me each week to hear you sing these words, to hear the prayers of your heart expressed in the words that you sing. So thank you. Will you join me in prayer? Eternal God, on this Palm Sunday, time is marked as a small donkey plods toward Jerusalem with a face set like flint, feet almost grazing the ground, she walks forward, not in the power of horses and swift victory, but in small, steady steps toward the mystery that through suffering, healing comes, that through shame, dignity is restored, that through the cross, powers are disarmed and death done away with forever. Bless us as we also walk forward doing the small yet great works of nonviolent peacemaking that we do in hospitals, homes, grocery stores, classrooms, churches, and cubicles. Blessed are we as we join the crowds, waving palm branches to shout ourselves hoarse, Hosanna, save us, Save our world, transform us, and heal our lives. Listening, God, you hear the rumbles and the wails underneath our shouts of praise and gratitude, and you know the yearnings of our hearts, our desires for wholeness of bodies and minds, for relationships reconciled and trust restored, for peace to prevail on this precious, vulnerable planet. We watch in horror at the things people are capable of and willing to do to those they deem less than human. God of miracles, in this season where miracles are anticipated, remembered, and celebrated, Send your resurrection power and bring new life to the hearts and places where death presides. Mighty God, hear our prayer and answer. Healing God, we pray for those among us in need of relief. Relief from pain, relief from infection, relief from anxiety, relief from fear. Reveal yourself in the faces of doctors and nurses and therapists. 
Reveal yourself in the words and arms of family, friends, and caregivers. Bring healing as only you can. In this time, this precious holy week, give us obedient hearts to share the story of your love, the way you fully understand suffering and walk with us through our own pain. Help us share these things with a world in desperate need of that promise of unconditional welcome. Listening God, hear our prayers, transform our hearts and heal our lives. Amen.
Today, we remember how the early followers were sent to find a donkey for Jesus to ride into Jerusalem. We can picture the crowd offering their cloaks and cutting branches from the trees to celebrate the coming of the Son of God. In like manner, we offer our tithes and gifts today, eager to be part of those who celebrate Jesus, the Christ, among us, not just for a parade, but all the way to the cross, the grave, and entering into life beyond life. Let's give with grateful, obedient hearts, eager to share the joy of following God's beloved. Will the ushers please come forward to collect our tithes and gifts of love? Pray with me. Gracious God, you have given us blessings beyond measure, hearts of mercy, hands of grace, and the presence of Christ in our souls and in our lives. We can never repay what we have received, so help us carry it forward. May we use the gifts of hearts and hands to sustain the weary in word and in deed. Awaken us to all who long for your peace and give us courage and obedient hearts to walk with them. Amen. You may be seated. So what's up with the donkey?
To quote someone from Scripture Chat on Tuesday night, we're all thinking it, so I'm just going to ask, what is up with the donkey? Was it one donkey, as it is in every other gospel? Or was it a mama and a baby donkey, two donkeys? Did Jesus spread the cloak somehow over both of them and then sort of straddle precariously, tilting to one side because they're not the same height? And if so, was there anything regal about that? Has this one little detail included only in the Gospel of Matthew completely derailed the point of this story? Or has this seemingly absurd detail become the actual point? If you have caught up with Jesus at any point during his public ministry, you have likely heard of a miracle or two. He regularly provided healing for all sorts of maladies, sight to the blind, strength and mobility to the lame and paralyzed, freedom from the things that possessed people, and even relief for a woman who had bled for 12 years. And usually, these miracles were followed by the admonition, shh, don't tell anybody. But everything is different now. Today, Jesus is prepared, no matter the consequences, to claim his kingship. Now, if you were going to claim your own royal title, how would you go about it? You'd spend some time planning, I would think. You'd invite dignitaries. You'd reserve a venue well in advance. You'd contract with a caterer. You'd buy some new clothes, maybe even get fitted for a tiara. I learned as my mind wandered down this path this week, that Queen Elizabeth's one-day coronation took 14 months to plan. So what about Jesus? This story feels very spontaneous, doesn't it? Hey, disciples, why don't you head on into this frenetic crowd and just take a donkey? And if anyone says anything, just tell them that the Lord needs it. You know, not that the Lord made a reservation ahead of time. Not that the Lord put down a security deposit. This may seem very spur of the moment, but I would argue that the details captured in this passage are meant to tell us that this event was well over 500 years in the making. In approximately 520 B.C., the prophet Zechariah claimed that the king of kings would come from the Mount of Olives. And Matthew makes a point at the beginning of this text to tell us that Jesus obediently begins his trek into Jerusalem from just that place. And then Zechariah makes this odd statement. The king will be riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This statement isn't meant to be taken literally. In fact, it employs a technique called poetic parallelism, describing the king's entry on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey, on a baby donkey, each word less impressive than the one before. The point is to reinforce how unmajestic it is to ride a lowly donkey instead of a great stallion. The author of Matthew does not want us to miss that. 
He's not making a literal claim that Jesus is somehow riding two donkeys. Instead, he is demonstrating Jesus' humility, his commitment to his purpose. He's proclaiming the links that Jesus will go to to display his loving graciousness to the world. And in this text, we see Jesus obediently set out on the path before him. And if these words sound familiar to you, well, they should. Humility, commitment, purpose, gracious, loving, and obedient. We are meant to understand that Christ's kingship is defined in terms of servanthood. Gentleness, humility, peaceableness, mercy, and self-giving acts of generosity and compassion are marks of God's domain. And they are virtually identical to the heart attitudes of discipleship that we have been working at and pursuing all of Lent. Jesus didn't ride a donkey, a donkey that he sent obedient disciples to procure no matter how crazy that request sounded. He didn't do that because he was too tired to walk or because he wanted a higher view of the crowds. This was done to fulfill prophecy. And it was done to make a statement. During Passover, the population of Jerusalem exploded from about 20 to 40,000 people to about 200,000. And all of the pilgrims traveled to this holy place to remember and celebrate their liberation from Egypt centuries earlier. So in response to this, the Romans put on a big display of force. While King Jesus descended from the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem from the east in fulfillment of Zechariah's ancient prophecy, the Roman governor Pilate entered Jerusalem from the west with all the pomp of state power. Pilate's brigades showcased Rome's military might and power and glory. Jesus' triumphal entry, by contrast, was an anti-imperial, anti-triumphal counter-procession of peasants that proclaimed an alternate vision called the Kingdom of God. And it's this kingdom that we are called to proclaim. Christ, our King, is the one who leads his people, the church, to march victoriously, nonviolently, even foolishly, into the center of worldly power, offering a different vision of God's will for the world, one that is unlike any leader, Caesar, ancient or contemporary, has ever offered. And when we wave our palms, we are claiming our allegiance with God's vision for this world. We spent the entirety of Lent seeking to develop the heart characteristics of Christ because it takes time and intentionality to allow God to work at shaping and molding our hearts. This isn't simply a spontaneous act. That Palm Sunday, the crowd was caught up by jubilant hysteria and joined in the praise without even knowing what it was about or why. And soon enough, this same crowd ended up in another crowd, where instead of shouting Hosanna, they shouted, crucify him. People in a crowd 
tend to feed off collective energy. And that kind of crowd, those without humble, committed, purposeful, gracious, loving and obedient hearts disperses as easily as it gathers. When people thought that Jesus had the potential to be their warrior king, they rallied behind him. But when they saw him dragged toward Pilate, when he wasn't meeting their expectations, they lined up behind those with earthly authority because they had no roots and their vision was short-sighted and their hearts were not molded into the likeness of Christ's. As soon as the going got tough, they supported the people and the programs that they thought offered them the most personal gain. But friends, we are held to a higher standard. We are held to a higher hope. Our commitment to Jesus is for the long haul, not for a sudden burst of excitement that changes from cheer to jeer as soon as the winds of circumstance change. The bleaker the world looks, the greater to give up and give in to temptation, losing hope that God's peace and justice will be served and all will be made whole. But friends, Jesus did not go through all of this to leave the world as it is. We are to continue the work of transformation that Jesus has begun within each one of us and share it with the world. Keeping with the character and the way of the one we call God with us is a continuing task, one that we with obedient hearts carry out in the manner of our living. We remember these stories year after year after year, and we tell them to each other so that we may find the courage to walk with Jesus and proclaim a word of peace and reconciliation. After all, Jesus' first followers possessed no formal authority to change their world. All that they had was transformed hearts. And this leads to the final question of Lent 2024. Jesus, himself acting in obedience to God's will for a peaceable kingdom, sent his followers on a seemingly ridiculous task. What task of faith? No matter how absurd it may seem, is God calling us to, inviting us to, obediently answer, yes, send me. And when we say yes, how might that change the world? Let's pray together. Loving God, thank you for showing us that humility is not weakness. In fact, it is just the opposite. Give us the commitment and purpose to preserve a gracious heart in a power-hungry world. Fill us with the disarming power of love because love is strength wrapped in peace and therein lies the power to change the world. Give us obedient hearts to make it so. 
Amen. I am not quite ready to give up this beautiful time that we've spent together the past six weeks, inviting God to change our hearts. I yearn to gather again this Thursday at seven to offer our thankful hearts in worship to God and in service to one another. But for now, go out willing to be obedient to God's ways of love and peace, even when especially when it seems foolish, and allow a deepening relationship with God and with neighbor to transform your hearts. Mm -hmm. 